Look at him over there. He's going through all his stuff. So you're effectively using almost like GPS navigation would with satellites, just minus the altitude part. That is exactly what I was doing. I'm smart and stuff sometimes. <laughs> What's up people? So today we are back with Genius Scratch and the IndyCar build. So right now, actually one of the students that's later in the day on Tuesday is over at his computer and he's got the solid models for the adapter plates. And also we're actually building a dry sump oil pan for it that will be a stress member and also strengthen the Honda K series motor. So let's walk around. I'm going to show you guys the parts and then Dylan over here, he's the one working on everything. We're going to talk to him, look at the solid model so you can guys get a feel for what's going on with this. So in the next few weeks, when we get the parts and start bolting the whole car together up on the table, then you're going to know exactly where we've been with the whole thing. So we're here at the shop. And just as a note, this is my Formula One hot rod build that I'm doing. There's Gavin. He's working on his Beamer. Yay. Anyway, there's my Formula One hot rod. So in about a week, I'm gonna have all the structural aspects done with this car back here with the tube frame and all. So I'll be actually be able to take this car down, put it down on the ground, so it'll be able to hold its own weight. I'll be working on it. I'll be working on the side pods and the carbon fiber under tray and finishing the wings, getting a feel for what it looks like when it's on the ground. But more importantly, or also importantly, this table will then be utilized and go over to Genius Garage because about that same time period, Dylan will have his adapter plates um, as well as the structural members so we can start bolting that engine together and then the car as a whole unit will start taking shape uh, and obviously right now this section here with the tires is backwards because that's the input shaft area and that's where the clutch goes so this is backwards and then here's the k-series so let's look at it right here so you guys see this is the front of the k-series motor don't you keep doing your thing i'm just going to show them real quick yeah. Um, here's the side, obviously, here's the front with the ancillaries, and you guys can see that the big pulley here that was on the front of the K-Series has been removed, and that was to drive just a serpentine belt. It's got a little bit of a harmonic dampener action going on, just a little bit there too. And we have this teeny tiny underdriven pulley, which drives the oil pumps right here for the dry sump. And then you've got your, it's gonna be a skinnier uh, serpentine drive, and we have to move the alternator and everything over. We'll probably go to an electric water pump just to, um, you know, free a little drag on that, free a little space. And then with the dry sump oil pump here, you guys see there's three fittings on the bottom right here and then two on the top. Obviously this whole thing is upside down. And how it works is this. This right here, is, there's an oil pump inside right here. There's an oil pump right here and there's an oil pump right here. So really we've got three oil pumps going on right here, here, and here. Uh, obviously they're all driven by a shaft from the belt of the crankshaft. Now, this one is separate and also has a pressure relief system here, which you can adjust the pressure relief. And this is where it actually sucks from the tank, which will be located somewhere else and gets pumped out and then into your motor to provide pressure. The other two here are for scavenging. So this pickup will go to the oil pan. This pickup will also go to the oil pan and they will suck the oil out of it. And then what happens is when the oil comes through right here, it's going to merge over to this one and both of these pump to one out, which then goes to your swirl tank so the oil can swirl around in it. And this isn't the one we'll be using, but there are two uh, dry sump oil tanks right here. This is one that was in the Indy car that'll be using the Formula One hot rod build. So this would be like where the oil goes in and it swirls around. And this would be like a pickup where you take it out. And this is the one that we are likely are using on the, the Formula One that was used on the Formula One hot rod build in the past. It's a radical. So you got your swirl where it swirls in here and goes down, and then you got a pickup on the bottom, and then this is probably a vent right there. So those are the tanks. Anyway, so what we've got, now we're gonna look at this again here real quick, you guys. These big studs here, which are just monsters, go into the carbon fiber monocoque, and then they have these jet nuts you can go onto. So that's the entirety of the structural place where it bolts together. And then these big studs here with these big CNC blocks, um, which we probably won't reuse these. This is where it bolts at the top portion. And then back here to the transaxle, you got your top mounts here, and then uh, you'd mount the transaxle here and here. This is the old adapter plate for adapting it to a small block Chevy. So on that note, let's go over here with Dylan and see exactly what he's got going on with the computer, with CAD design, and I don't mean cardboard aided. So what's- well, that is useful sometimes. Yes, cardboard aided design is something we use a lot. Do you think yeah. I use that more or you use that more? Um, you probably use it more than I do. Oh. Granted, I do use it a fair amount because yes, CAD and CAD go very well together. That's true, that's true, good point, yeah? Because it helps, uh, well, honestly, you've been 
doing, we joke about CAD being cardboard design or doing something on paper. You've been using both of those processes with this, haven't you? You can see my stack of papers right over there. Tell you what, why don't you grab some of those? Just right. maybe, maybe one of the ones on the bottom of the engine here that you can show how you use to uh, make sure you get the right points for the motor. We're doing the best we can here, guys, on light and all. Obviously, the light comes in through the window, and so it's a little tough. Look at him over there. He's going through all his stuff. It is my stuff. It is your stuff, sir. Let's see. And feel free to project your beautiful golden voice to my microphone here. Oh, yes. I have to be the mic guy, the on-camera talent, and the uh, camera guy all at once. I'm no camera talent. What do we got here? Why did you do this? Why is there paper on the motor? It's just getting dirty. Because I needed to confirm my bolt holes because basically without a 3D scanner, yes. this was extremely difficult to measure because for some reason, no three holes are actually on a similar plane. Like they're not in line. They're just all no, over the place. They're just, they're the same plane. So it could be a, a flat plane surface, but finding out where they are on two coordinates or axes, the other two is not easy. Right, you, yeah. you, can't, you can't relate like you can't just take a straight edge, measure this one, this hole, measure the distances and just put them in because mm -hmm. like this one's a little further in than this one. Yes. And like this one, they're just a mess. Sure. So let me ask you this though. I mean, I know the answer, but explain right. to everybody why there's a piece of paper here. Now, how did you do that? Because the other problem are printers. How do you know the printer printed it out exactly correct? So the best tool any vehicle builder slash hobbyist can have Dial calipers. Are they calipers or a caliper? Didn't you just say the same thing? Uh, in the past or like at this very moment? I'm confused. Okay, so your fancy measuring tools there. Get something good. Those are yes. Mitotoyos, yeah? Yes. Okay, so quality. let's let's see what you did here. So when you first started measuring this, what'd you do? So I found two points that I could measure i could get a distance from okay. that then when i have the print drawn out i can measure it make sure it's scaled right okay because i can measure between these two lines and as long as those are the distance because these are two very easy points to measure yes it, i can get that extremely accurately and in doing so i can compare the two i can get the scale factor if i need to modify it so that it can oh, come I out see. of the printer properly that's how you make sure your scale factor you go with two that you a known quantity correct okay now how did you then start finding out approximately where those points in space would go before you really dialed them in so i did attempt to make a loop around the base here okay. measuring point to point point to point point to point point to point kind of doing a hop and skip and so what i then ended up doing was these i measured all of these you're talking all, about the, the main crank, bolts the, the main crank, crank bolts, bolts right there your known quantity these are known points in the engine i measured them all they are all evenly spaced left to right front to back yes and so i took those and i was able to measure off of their washers because that was a known dimension. That is another known dimension. So if you got yourself two points where they intersect would be your hole placement. Correct. Got so it. here's here's how I did it. So you're effectively using almost like GPS navigation would with satellites, just minus the altitude part. Actually, that is, a, actually, I've never thought about it that way. That is exactly what I was doing. I'm smart and stuff sometimes. I just act like an idiot, you guys. <laughs> I'm doing yeah. the best I can. I'm stressed out. I'm trying. I'm trying to be sunny disposition and do smart that, things. And so Art. also what I did is I found one bolt. He does not care at all. Okay, you right. one bolt. I Where found was one it? Bolt. Did you drop it down in the engine? No. Okay, I found good. one bolt that uh -huh. I got a no, another known measurement from. A known measurement. And I used the same bolt okay. in the same orientation to make sure that I got the same measurement between each point. And I just created triangles. Okay. And between and on my CAD program, I can draw this length. Yes. And this length. Yes. And then tell the end point of this line and this line to meet at a certain point, and that gives me my triangle. Okay, very cool. So that's how you got it. And then you had to do some different printouts, cut them out nicely, put them over, no scaled right, and then allowed you to know if something was off, and then you just shifted it. Correct. And then you went through two iterations of that before you were pretty dead on? 
With intolerance? Three. Three iterations? Okay. Third time's a charm. Okay, so that was Usually. a really good thing. So let's do this. I don't have a ton of batteries on this, and we're going to come back to it, but let's look at some of your models here and see exactly what you got before you send it in. Because, one, you've done a special flywheel, which your yes. guy is making out of aluminum just as a start, just to see and get kind of make sure he's got all the tooling going the way he wants before it's done out of the steel. Correct. And then your pan, the basic pan here, um, and you haven't done any lightning, anything as of yet for now. We're just getting the basic structure um with that going on correct and so here we are so hold on one sec i'm gonna, I'm gonna have to do the best i can guys i'm holding lots of stuff including the camera hey hey here we go hold on i'm on this i swear yes look how sweaty i am it's hot in here i know i'm not even wearing my hat okay i'm gonna come to the other side because we got a bunch of glare okay all right you all now so, this is the fly this is the flywheel this, this is, is the, the clutch flywheel. puck this is this is yeah this is the flywheel this bolts to the output shaft of the K-Series. Yep. This so all of those, the inner circle here, these guys, those bolts, the, yes, the flashing plane you yep. just surfaced, <laughs> that's where it bolts to the engine. Correct. And then that hole in the middle, rotate that slightly about 45 degrees so we can see a 3D view. Great. And then this area, this recess area right here is where um, the pilot bearing will go for the input shaft, right? Yep, that we will be making out of oil impregnated bronze. Excellent. Yeah, I like that. We were thinking about doing a needle bearing, but we think the bronze will let us get away with more long in run. IndyCar input shafts are a weird size that nobody makes bearings in. Yeah, well, welcome to life. <laughs> okay, guys, so, and then obviously this outer ring here is for the... Um, clutch the clutch outer housing okay and then lastly so you can see that it's a little bit thick now let's see the top surface of it now truth be told let's see the sur surface more rotate more i want to see the surface where the clutch goes yes yes stop this surface here if you can illuminate that make it flash that surface there it's a little lighter color guy he's making it flash the clutch friction disc will actually ride on that mm -hmm. and you astute observers will notice that some of it is missing because it has to be drilled for where the bolts will go in now that's okay um, because quite frankly, if you look at the stock one here, look at that, look at that surface. There's even way more missing. So uh, that the original one has a bigger flywheel uh, bolt pattern because it went on a small block Chevy. This is a K series. So we're gonna get a little more, but it's gonna work just fine. So uh, Dylan, let's, uh, let's take a look at, let's go to your oil pan real quick. All right, oil pan. Great. Now, as a note, guys, light, there has not been lightning in this. This is largely a solid block, and we're going to show you the relief for the, uh, where the oil is and the crankcase in there, and then also where it's going to bolt in the front and the rear. So let's uh, go ahead and illuminate the surface of the inside. Great. These two faces right here. Indeed. Now, rotate a little bit so we can view that a little bit better. Guys, that is, don't do, go a 3D view. You're going too straight on. Okay, guys, so you can see here, see this opening? That opening is effectively the inside of the pan, all right? Now this post right here, if you can see, that gives us a little extra strength. Just We're picking up another bolt hole point kind of in the middle. And then these holes here, this one and this one, now I'm gonna rotate this around real quick. Those holes are the same ones here, and they've got two uh, tapped openings, which you can see. Now that is gonna be where the pickup points for the oil will in fact bolt in. And do you have one of those handy, Dylan? The pickups? Yeah, just let's look at one. Okay. Okay, go ahead and take the cap off, please. All right. Yes! Don't mind the oiliness. Yeah, there it is. Now rotate it so they can see the pickup screen part. Okay, that'll be oriented down, and that's where it will actually pick up the oil for it. And those will bolt into the, uh, it'll bolt into the uh, oil pan there. Now, guys, let's take a look. Now, don't forgive me for taking over here. Go ahead and push the shift button for me, please. Okay, guys, so up here, this would be the front of the pan. This is the rear, okay? Now the front, if you notice, there's a bigger space right there. Let go of shift, please. Thank you. If you guys notice, there is a larger area from here to here than there is from here to here. Now the reason being is we need this added space um, to go in front of the motor all the way up to the monocoque because your ancillaries and your belts are basically gonna go here. So you need that area. Back here, the engine, we need this surface to be at the same place as the bell housing so the adapter plate can bolt to that where it goes to the transmission. And if you push the shift key again, please. 
Thank you. Okay, guys, so you can see under here, Dylan has done all of the holes to attach the pan to the engine, including some larger ones with dowel pins, and also has reliefed an area so that we're gonna use ARP bolts. Those will be able to go in and be flush um, with the bottom, because this will be the very bottom of the car, and then the aerodynamic under tray will go there. Now, if you notice, there are some precise placed holes right here. Those would be the four studs that attach to the carbon monocoque, and they will go right inside there like that, and then these relief rectangular holes are where you'll put the jet nut in and give you just enough room to put a wrench. Um, you know, and I'm illustrating, you stick a wrench in there to be able to turn it and tighten it. Um, so it's pretty, pretty tight tolerances and all like that. And actually it'll be hand tightened, uh, but in this circumstance, it allows it to be very strong. So we're going with it. And then push set, shift again, please. Okay, and you guys can see the same thing. You can see the holes, how they go through there, where the nut will go. And then you have the same thing going on in the rear. Now, one nifty thing, you can see there's a hole here and here to pick up on the engine, and those are fall within the pockets. So they're countersunk way in there and will not intrude upon putting the nuts. So that's how it bolts. These guys in the back will be where it attaches to the plate. I'll zoom out. So that's, that's your dry sump pan. And then let's check out the adapter plate. And Dylan, we're gonna have to do this quick because the battery's dead. Okay. Well, there's the adapter plate. Okay guys, here's the adapter plate. So we're not gonna be able to go over the whole thing right now because the battery is dying. But we hope you dig it. Spin that around real quick. Let's see your reliefs. This is the yep. interesting There's side. There's some of the reliefs because we have to do that in the assembly process because you cannot get to the transaxle bolts otherwise. So guys, that's basically what's going on here at Genius Garage. I hope you enjoyed seeing this. I'm sorry it's real impromptu. I'm holding the camera doing the best I can. But that's a lot of the fun of it. Obviously, you can see the Reynard uh, IndyCar or Champ Car chassis back there and all the rest of the Genius Crush stuff. And then Dylan's staying here late. So he's putting a lot of time into that. But, you know, it takes a lot of us to get it right on because, you know, he's doing an awesome job. Sometimes there might be something you don't quite see. Maybe we need a little bit more room or we just catch a dimension that could get in the way of a uh, nut in a bolt or a washer or getting a wrench in or something like that. So it's really great. I hope you guys enjoy this. Please subscribe and obviously click that bell. Uh, any of my merchandise that you buy down below, all the profits go directly to the Genius Garage nonprofit to support projects like this. So hope you guys come back. This is the IndyCar build. Obviously, we're excited about Rob Dom doing an IndyCar as well. And we'll see you next time. Well, a huge thank you to Crush Proof Tubing Company. Since 1949 in Macomb, Ohio, they've been manufacturing custom rubber and plastic tubes for every industry imaginable. No tooling or mold costs, fast and free custom samples, and American-made quality is what sets them apart. But for me, I'm most excited about their exhaust evacuation kit. Different modular pieces and their convoluted custom hoses make it so that I can adapt any car, truck, or motorcycle with an internal combustion engine to get those exhaust gases out of my shop so I can keep working in safety and comfort. But beyond just that, they build a variety of hoses for a custom OEM world. You'll see stretchable drain tubing and bellows, as well as agriculture, medical, and military. So again, guys, Crush Proof Tubing Company, crushproof.com, and go down in the description below to see where to get your free samples for industry or your exhaust tubing.